started here. Speakers. We have six people who are going to share their thoughts and feelings and hearts with you and with us. But we're going to start out tonight with a little music by Levin Dodge. Uh, Michelle and Aaron, Levin Dodge. All right. I would like to invite everybody to the rally. This is a lot of fun for us. And we're grateful that we were invited to come down here and hang out with you guys this evening. First song we're going to do for you, it's called Throwing It All Away. One of our tunes, a song about doing your own thing out there and having your own identity, which uh, seems like the Green Party really promotes that, as do we, and this is, this is a great uh, combination. Here we go. Yeah. 
closely voted. And get this down a little bit. Down like that. And some years ago, maybe decades now, I remember every now and then hearing something about the Green Party from Germany and Europe. And I didn't hear a lot about them, but everything I heard was really exciting to me. But of course, they weren't in our country. So I keep voting for the candidates in this country. And for a long, long time, I always believed that it made a difference you voted for. But as the years have gone by, it's become harder and harder to cast that vote. And the good luck is that right about the time when I can't bear it any longer, the Green Party has jumped across the ocean and is in our country. But we've invited you here tonight, and we're happy you're here, and thank you for coming, everyone. Because it says you care, and there's not a lot of that around these days. Um, my name is Virginia Height. I am a native of northern Michigan. I am a mother, a wife, an organic gardener, and a community volunteer and activist. I'm one of the people that brought this rally to town. We've invited you here today because we want you to learn about the Green political party and movement, which is perhaps the largest political party in the world, having germinated, taken root, become organized, and is now growing on, in some 75 different countries on every continent in the world except Antarctica. We've invited you here today so that you can learn about a positive, democratic, political alternative to what we now have in Washington. And why do we want an alternative? Well, I'm not a spokesman for the Green Party, but I consider myself part of the Green Party. But what we have in Washington, I believe, and everyone I speak to believes, are basically two major parties, the Republicans and the Democrats, that, are, that have converged into one. One party with a corporate body with two different heads wearing different makeup, as Ralph Nader says. If you believe that institutionalized greed, institutionalized bribery, and institutionalized, institutionalized corruption are the forces that should be directing our government and leading our government to become a government of the Exxon by the DuPont for the Monsanto, then I guess you're happy with what we've got. But if you're like many of us who can't bear it anymore and who can't stand by and watch our democracy and our freedoms being sold to the highest bidder, then welcome to the Green Party. We've invited you here today so that you can learn about the Green Party, which is the party we believe offers the best hope for reclaiming our democracy and our freedoms and returning our government to we, the people, of the people, by the people, for the people. We believe the Green Party also offers the best hope for our children and for future generations for actually creating a healthy, humane, sustainable society. Um, we have a lot of speakers here today and you're going to hear from local activists who are living the Green philosophy. The Green Party has a wonderful philosophy. The four pillars of the Green Party are ecological wisdom, grassroots democracy, 
social justice, and nonviolence. The party uh, also runs by 10 values, which are equally as good. We have a lot of information over here. Please take it. Please help yourself and learn about the Green Party. I'm just going to say a few things about why I'm ready to make a change. And I want to know why. I would just ask the same question, you the same questions I'm asking myself. Why is it in the most prosperous era we've had in this country, corporations who are making hundreds of millions and billions of dollars of profits cannot pay their employees a living wage? Like Walmart. Why is that? Why is it they tell us they have to be mean and lean to be competitive? And then without any blinking of an eye, they go into mergers and corporate takeovers, which cost millions to hundreds of millions to billions of dollars, and they don't blink an eye. But they can't pay their employees a living wage. I've learned about the WTO recently. And if you don't know about the WTO, you better learn about it. And I'm hoping Tom Ness, our U.S. Green candidate for Senate, who will be our, our featured speaker tonight, will enlighten you all. If those brave, wonderful activists in Seattle hadn't stopped the recent uh, WTO treaty from being ratified, just one of the wonderful things in that treaty would have been that the corporations were going to privatize the entire global water supply. The table, entire global water supply could have been now owned by corporate powers. Think about that. What's happening in our government is a systematic takeover from the rightful legal unit of government, which is the people, and it's being traded into corporate power. Corporations are now working to become the legalized unit of governments, governance. And it's already happened to a large degree. We've been asleep. We're not paying attention. Our democracy and our freedoms are disappearing. I'm angry because our so-called leaders have decided we in the United States can be guinea pigs for genetically engineered foods. Anywhere from 60 to 70 percent of the foods in our grocery store contain genetically altered ingredients. They don't have a clue about the long-term effects of what these ingredients do to the human body. They're already releasing these organisms into our environment, and guess what? Hey, surprise, they just found out pollen from genetically altered organisms killed monarch butterflies. And here's one for you. Capitalistic society the insurance companies will not insure these products. Now doesn't that tell you that the capitalistic society has spoken? But the government tells us they're safe, and do you know why they tell us they're safe? Because the biotech companies told them so. And that's who's running our government. I spent $50 out of my own pocket to buy 200 of these. Please take one or two or five. There are letters already written here to our legislators. There is a national campaign to demand labeling on genetically engineered foods. Do you know in Europe there's a revolution going on about these foods? There's a revolution. And you don't even hear about it in this country. Why? Because our media is owned by the corporations who are profiting from this kind of technology. We are not getting the information we need. The corporations have bought our public airwaves, which our candidate Tom Ness can again talk to you about. He knows all about it. Tom Ness fought a three-year battle to open up our community airwaves to the public, and he won a little crumb. And they're already trying to take that away from us. Um, Well, I could go on. Please take these. Find out about bioengineering, what they're doing. Let me say one more thing here. 
One of the arguments for um, biotech uh, genetic lottery in our crops is that, well, we can use less pesticides now because now the plant uh, makes the, its own pesticide, you see. We can use less. But what they're doing is creating plants that can stand more because they also sell the pesticides. And what they don't tell you is that now, instead of occasional pesticide applications, every single cell and every single corn plant in the entire millions of acres planted around the world is now a chemical factory producing chemical toxins 24 hours a day, seven days a week, as long as that plant's alive. And then they're having us eat it. Right now, the vast majority of potatoes you're buying are genetically altered, but they're not labeled. If the WTO had been, if, if the WTO a treaty had been ratified in Seattle, and you can thank those activists who were shot in the mouth with rubber bullets and their teeth were broken, who, were, who had pepper spray sprayed into their eyes, no country would be able to reject biotech foods. This is what's happening. They're creating the laws to force us to buy these products. They're trying to eliminate culture and diversity. And that's what's going on. So anyway, I get a little upset. But that's okay. We've got to get upset. Right? All right. All right. So <laughs> we, we have children to take care of. And we have to have a future for our children. I have twin boys, and I love them very much. All right, let's bring on some more voices here. But I've spoken long enough. I'm just going to jump in. She's oh. yakking. I'm going to go right. ahead and I'm going to work the crowd. She said, bring in more voices. I jumped on the opportunity. Okay. I've got petitions. Yeah. In order to get the Green yeah. Party on the ballot in Michigan, we need registered voters to sign these petitions, or all of this is for nothing. So, on my first trip around, which she more ele elegantly spoke, if we keep doing what we've done, we're going to keep getting what we've got. And I know she doesn't like what we have any more than I do. So what we do is we sign these ballots for access. And then I'll go around the crowd in hopes that I get signatures with this. And then after that, while there are other speakers going on, I'm going to pass a hat and ask for money. We need money. This is not a free society. Unfortunately, we have to borrow money from anybody that will give it to us. So now you can have the mic back, and I'm going to go work the crowd. If they're not registered, we can register them. Oh, in fact, if you're not registered, she just informed me, we can register you to vote. So there's no more excuses. So who's next up here on the mic? Um, Joanne Beeman, a local activist. Okay, wait a minute. Is Rick, is Rick here? Yeah. Rick Meisterheim. Oh, cool. Okay. Here's another. Okay. Another yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Rick Meisterheim. Uh, here, here, here's a man who's really turned off to politics, sickened. But when he's learning, now since he's learned about the Green Party, he's here to speak. Rick is the director and developer of the Wagabo Peace Center. He lives and creates the Green Philosophy. The Green Philosophy is alive and well right here in East Jordan. Rick Meisterheiser. Well, don't clap yet. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not saying I'm any more politically uh, enthused anyway. Um, <clears throat> they told me that one time I, someone said, don't uh, mix religion with politics. Pretty hard for me, um, obviously. But I'm going I'm to start with a quote. It's first Proverbs says, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity. And I want to emphasize equity. Webster states it is the state or quality of being equal or fair. Virginia mentioned to me these four pillars, and I can't help but agree with all these pillars. Ecological wisdom, social justice, nonviolence. Grassroots democracy. It's beautiful, isn't it? I was asked to talk about sustainable agriculture. Probably most of you know what that is. 
is basically old-fashioned farming with lots of years of mistakes to learn from. A little more technology to work with. <clears throat> But it's without the poisons, and without try the attempt to try not to bring about environmental degradation. But we'll talk about why that's pretty hard in, yet tonight. Um, farming, it, it's basically farming with ecological wisdom. That's the first pillar, right? Conventional farming thrived for years, or we'll call it chemical farming, as a result of social injustice, or might I say economical injustice. It's pretty hard to produce food for the world, food for the country, when you can't hardly cover your cost of production, let alone co cover your cost of living. Pretty hard to give back when you haven't got anything to give back. You got to be people like myself who are willing to live at below poverty level of income to produce food for people. Pretty sad, isn't it? So we have social injustice. I'd like to see social justice, the second pillar. I have a quote by Benjamin Franklin that I'd like to read to you. It sort of addresses the third pillar, which is nonviolence. It's a quote from April 4th, 1769. So there are three ways that a nation might prosper. I just got to add one more religious thing. <laughs> Prosper, if you look it up in the concordance, it, it means peace. Okay? Same thing. Three ways that a country might prosper by war, which permits the taking by force the wealth of other nations, by trade, which is to be profitable requires cheating. For if you, for example, if you, if we give and receive equal amounts of goods and services through trade, there is no profit. And the third, by agriculture, through which we plant the seed, and it creates new wealth as if by a miracle. We don't have to fight wars and cheat other people to have a good quality of life, to prosper. All we have to do is receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, ju judgment, and equity. By giving parity or equity. And it has to happen in every sector of the economy. You can't short the agri agricultural sector of the economy and, and have these pillars stand. By shortcutting the agriculture, we have set the stage or set the course for social injustice, economical ignorance, or I mean ecological ignorance, wars and all kinds of violence, and corporate democracy. That's what we have. It's really hard for me to speak to this because you know, I have the answer, but who's going to listen to me? The answer is equity. Problem is, that's a bad word. Why, it's un-American. Right? I mean, they put other names on things like that, like social something or other, or com something or other. I mean, it's awful. But it's equity. And so we got to treat people equi with equity. <clears throat> See, that's the problem, is I can't, I'm having a hard time seeing political implementation of equity. 
So perhaps the last pillar, grassroots democracy, is the only way. If we can change the hearts of people, the souls of people, the minds of people, maybe that we can have equity. But it has to happen with us, we the people, as Virginia said. And we have to seek out ways to build up our, our ecological agriculturists, our family farms, our peacemakers, as I call them. And how do we do this? We go out. How many of you belong to a, a CSA? Community supported agriculture. You see, we gotta do it. That's what we gotta do. We gotta support this because I'm gonna go into a little bit of stuff that's probably gonna go like that. Okay, but I have to share this and there's I can give you the information or, or the where to get the information. But it's been proven that for every dollar we give to the raw material sector of our economy, it produces seven times that in our in our economy. Because we've shortcutted our agriculture sector of the economy, we don't have the income to, per, to, to consume what we produce in this country, so we borrow money. So we keep de decreasing the value of money. My parents paid like $20,000 for a house today. It's probably worth $150,000. It isn't worth that much more. It's still worth $20,000. The value of the dollar has dropped so far. But it takes that many more dollars to buy the same house. But we can change that if we just pay the farmer. Go home and lock on to this. www.norm, NORM, which stands for the National Organization for Raw Materials, Economics, NORM Economics Organization dot org. Or NORM EC, NORM, NORM Economics org dot org. Look at what that says. And look at what Carl Wilkins did for us. It, Carl Wilkins is a man who got us out of the Great Depression. Virginia, you can tell me to stop whenever you want. I, I, know, I know I got 15 minutes, that's why I tried to write it down here. But, but he, he got us out of the Depression because he stabilized parity agriculture. He says you can have parity war, you can have parity agriculture. And, and today in this country we have parity war. We have no parity agriculture. And we live in on borrowed money, or as I'm concerned, borrowed time. We gotta pay the agricultural sector and the economy fairly. If we don't treat each other equally, all the way across the board, God can't make things work. Okay? If you want it to work, we pay we pay a fair price. And the best way is to go out and find that farmer and pay him pay him the price. And watch what happens in this country. Now, I'd love it if I could talk to this Nader fella sometime about this. Maybe some of you can direct him my way. Because that's the other problem. I can't seem to find anybody who wants to even understand it. They pick up this book, written by Charles Walters, and they read four pages, and they say, oh, that's too dense for me. That's what they say. I thought, hey, I'm, you know, I, I'll be honest with you, I haven't got that much education, but I understand it because I understand what equity means. My heart says we have to treat everybody equally. I, I hope the Green Party is successful. I, I, I got my name on the ballot, I'm going to vote, with, you know, I'll stick with you, but uh, you've got to help yourselves. That's what you've got to do. The Green Party is the only political party I know of that specifically supports small farmers, locally owned agriculture, small farmers, organic farmers, and that kind of thing. We would change the agricultural policies of this country to make them fair. Um, we've got several. I guess the next person we're going to hear from is Joanne Beeman. She's an award-winning conservationist. Uh, she won a wonderful award from the state of Michigan. What was that, Joanne? WCC Conservationist of the Year, Environmentalist of the Year from Munich. Um, MUCC Conservationist of the Year. 
and she is also the founder of the Charlotte County Land Conservancy. And you will never meet a more passionate person who loves the earth and cares more than this woman. I love her, Joanne. I'm really uh, honored and really happy to be here. Uh, to, today I, I brought two of my favorite, well actually three of my favorite documents. One is the Declaration of Independence. I love the Decla Declaration of Independence and I love what it says, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men and women are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among people deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Sounds awfully socialistic. <laughs> it's democracy. Here we have another one. I love the preamble to the Constitution of the United States. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution of the United States of America. Isn't that wonderful? Talking about common good. You know, now, when politicians talk, they don't very often talk about things like justice and common good. We're all so afraid that we're going to be called socialistic or communistic, and it is the basis of a democracy, our democracy. What we are doing is, this is what I want to say, it's so important. We are confusing democracy with capitalism. Capitalism is an economic system. Capitalism does not have an ethic Capitalism does not care about the future of children. Capitalism is a system that is built on economic gain and profit. And we wonder why things are going to hell in a handbasket when we have made the market the god. We have made profits and the gross domestic product the altar at which we worship. And we have forgotten to think about things like the common good and justice. So now is our time to think about that. And I love the Green Party because the Green Party is talking about justice. I want to show you a document that to me is one of the most important documents in the world. This is called The World Scientist Warning to Humanity. 1,700 of the greatest scientists in the whole world signed this document. Half of all Nobel laureates signed this document. You know, you think that a document like this would be featured on TV and that people would be aware of what this was all about. But it never got on the TV. Um, I haven't seen documentaries about it, although I've seen a lot about Monica Lewinsky and about where, where I should be investing my money. But the World Scientist Warning has been largely ignored. The World Scientist Warning basically says that unless we change the way that we are living, unless we change this path we are on, our children will reap great economic, social misery. The World Scientist Warning says that we have major problems with our environment, the atmosphere, water resources, oceans, soil, forests, living species. They talk about the P word, <clears throat> population. Yes, God said go out and uh, multiply and fill the earth, but we did that. We've been there. It's time to stop. <laughs> let's, let's break the no talk rule. It's time to talk about population. All right, what we must do, we must bring environmentally damaging activities under control. We must manage resources. We must stabilize populations. We must reduce and eliminate poverty. Poverty is as wrong as racism. There is no reason for any child to be hungry. There is no reason for any child to go without a good education. Um, and we must ensure sexual equality. This is a wonderful document. So, anyway, what, uh, <clears throat> okay, look, one of the things about, um, one of the things that we have to do, I think that we have to do three things. 
Long time ago, um, Helen Caldicott was in um, Traverse City. And uh, I don't, when I was a child, I was always afraid of nuclear war. And my children were afraid of environmental disasters and the, and the loss of manatees. And, and Helen Caldicott said this to me. She said, when your child wakes crying in the night, afraid of the future and afraid of the loss of, of beautiful creatures on the earth, she said, hold your child to you and say, don't you worry, honey, mama's going to fix it. And then you go out there and fix it. So my message to you is that, one, we must maintain a truthful presence. And when people say to you, this is the most prosperous time in history, you say, prosperity is justice. Prosperity means that every child is fed. Prosperity means that we have ended poverty. This is not a prosperous time for everyone, and it is not the most prosperous time in our nation's history. When we have the division of wealth, it's a time of great injustice, and we have to start addressing that. Okay, so we must maintain a truthful presence. We must dare to say that's a lie. It's a lie that this is the most, that this is the most prosperous time when we're only counting the amount of the environment that's going through the consumer mill and used. A tree is only worth something when it becomes a house. What would happen if we measured the worth of a tree in oxygen? in beauty, in species diversity, in habitat. We don't know, we're the only, you know, I mean, I don't have, I don't have, I, I'm, I'm not real good with money and so I don't have, I don't have credit cards. But I know that when you take money out, you have to subtract it from something. We aren't counting what we've used up. We're only taking credit for what we use. I want to tell you, in Michigan right now, we have taken three huge blows in the last four months. One, the timber mandate, devastating to our force, absolutely devastating. It mandates that for the DNR to be paid, basically we have to take a certain number of cords out per acre so that we're managing our force not by science and not by need and not by intellect, but we're, we're managing it by a dollar sign. Um, Wetlands, the National, um, National Wetlands Act, it makes wetlands, um, it, it, what they're doing is asking our DNR to support them in um, a nationwide wetlands fill permitting process, which basically says, which lightens up the permits and enables us to fill. The wetlands that are left in this area are left because they're difficult to fill, and we've already lost more than 50% of our wetlands. If we want diversity of species, we have to have the wetlands. We're losing our wetlands. Our wetlands are an endangered, globally rare ecosystem. The Nature Conservancy did a study on rare, rare ecosystems, and this is one of the most rare ecosystems in the world, and it's endangered, and we're allowing it to be filled just as if we're, we're Arizona or Texas or something like that. It's insane. Um, Okay, so we have, we have the filling of the wetlands, the timber mandate, and does anyone else remember what the third one is? Because I've forgotten, but I'm sorry. Um, okay, so one of the things that, that it's, it's tempting to do is say, our government is now so corrupt, uh, corrupted that we have to get rid of government. What I'm saying to you is that if you want an example of someone who's getting rid of government, look at John Engler. John Engler's idea of downsizing. John Engler's idea of downsizing is to create a mini dictatorship. I have, I'm always waiting for him to come out with the laurel leaves around his head. <clears throat> well, what we need is responsible government. And what tickles me so about the Green Party is it's the first time in a long time that we've had a choice. And doggone it. You know what? It's not just Democrats. I'm tired of people saying to me, oh no, you're gonna, you're, you are going to be responsible for electing George Bush because people are going to leave the Al Gore camp. There are Republicans that feel just as disenchanted, just as lost, just as um, ineffectual. Um, <clears throat> the, the pathology of our society is not just the pathology of poor people. It's not just the pathology of a democratic party. It's not just the pathology of our ghettos. 
It is a loss of quality of life and dreams and ideals. How are we raising children now who don't believe that they will be able to exist and that their children will be able to live because they think that we're on this fast track to destruction? Because what we know is that this path that we are on is not sustainable. And it's destroying the earth. It's like the petri dish test. You put bacteria and food in a petri dish and the, and the bacteria will multiply and eat up all the food and then there's a sudden collapse in the population. You know, the, the, the little riddle is if you have a lily pad and it doubles every day and you have a lily, lily pad pond, on what day is that pond half full? It's not a test and you won't get graded. But the day that the pond is half full is the day before it's full. And we're close, and we may be at the halfway point. Population is exponential. And we have to start using resources wise. Anyway, OK, maintain a truthful presence. Maintain a truthful presence. Say that's a lie. Understand that everything that you do counts. If you invest in Nike, if you invest in Philip Morris, if you invest, really, honest, you know, if you invest in companies that are real profitable but are destroying the environment in other countries and are killing children by making them work 18-hour days, we are responsible and we have not improved the world. You know? And the very best investment, the very best investment of our money and our time and our resources is in our communities. We have to start creating sustainable communities. We have to pay our farmer. Instead, Unfortunately, we are, we're also insecure and we're also fearful. We're all told that we have to invest more. Watch TV, they'll tell you, you have to invest more, you have to have a diversified portfolio of stocks and bonds in order to have security. But what we all know, have you, have you seen Soros has split? He's not in the market anymore. He said it's crazy. He said it's like a circus. He said it's a casino. They're not in the market anymore. Some of them are leaving. Why is that? Because Security is not in stuff. Security is in justice. Security is in democracy. You know, that's where we have, okay, so understand that everything that we do as part of the web is important. Dare to live simply. Dare to make your life quality. Dare to change the world. And dare to be hopeful. Dare to spread hope. Dare to tell the children, we're going to make it better and then go out there and do that. I just have one other thing, if I can find it here. Um, I just, I thought this was nice. I accidentally wrote this one morning when I couldn't sleep. But it's sort of like the vision in, in, of what I see. Accepting and embracing the awesome responsibility and possibilities of our humanness and creativity, we assert that we can begin a new journey of hope and healing in our land and in our communities. This hope gives us the courage to realistically assess and accept the magnitude of the destructiveness, our present path of materialism, and our lack of reverence, for living things has cost our children and our world. We come together to, con to affirm and create a new journey of healing, of hope, of good work, and of joyous abundance. We proclaim the possibilities of peace, the simple living, right action, and reverence for all living things can bring to a suffering world. And we're doing that locally. We're, we're establishing water shed, shed centers, we have a Boyne City Watershed Center. We have an East Jordan Watershed Center. We have a Charlevoix Land Conservancy, a Little Travis Conservancy. There are lots of places that you can put um, time and energy and do support dialogue and be honest and support the Green Party things. And a very dear friend of mine, Michael Sullivan, asked if he could say a few words. Michael turned me on to drumming. Uh, he's the founder of Visions of Peace Drum and Dance Company, and he's brought drumming to many people in northern Michigan. Michael. Woo! Thanks, Jenny. Um, 
wanted to uh, recognize our wonderful thing that Jimmy did on Earth Day this year um, with the Boyne City Playground. Um, if any of you are from Boyne City, you can get over to the public school and see the uh, raised beds that were put in, the trash that was collected, the hope that was installed, um, the music that was played on that day. Um, Jimmy had a Anishinaabe elder come and speak to the children and um, about the earth and that's kind of what's given me a lot of hope this uh, this year is that uh, certain people are doing certain things around our, our area that are creating change and uh, I like the Meister Harms um, I'm an organic gardener and have felt the ultimate despair of <laughs> jumping into that field and uh, and um, I also, you know, wanted to just reiterate um, some of the things that Rick was saying. Um, he mentioned, yes, if anyone is, is in a CSA, and um, I didn't see any hands go up, so <laughs> wanted to just kind of say what a CSA is. Um, CSA stands for Community Supported Agriculture, and it's a pretty neat thing that started, I believe it is, is much as I found out about it, um, it started in Japan with uh, some uh, mothers going to uh, hog farms and uh, hog farmers and securing a um, a share in their produce of meat, and um, so that the farmer has security, uh, financial security, and the consumers have uh, the security of knowing where their food comes from. And, uh, and that's, in this day and age, uh, that's a wonderful thing to have. And uh, um, my thanks to the Waipo Peace Center for starting one of those in this area. And uh, also there's one that started up in Cross Village. Um, there are a few other local uh, organic farms. Um, Pond Hill Farm, if you're in the uh, Harbor Springs area. and. Um, Anyone else who comes up can maybe mention a few of those out because I really believe that uh, buying our food locally is uh, a big key to the, the environmental, social, economic, all these crises. Um, and, and one thing I just wanted to add on to all the things that Rick said is that one thing that makes this as, as I understand, it makes the social injustice from the farmer to the consumer is the middle person. And uh, that middle person, <laughs> I remember when I was working at White Bull, I would work in the field all day, and I would go to the Red Mesa Grill, and I'd work really hard all day to, to grow food, and I would make uh, probably 10 times more food taking the, the, the cooked food from the kitchen to the table <laughs> as a waiter. I would make <laughs> way more money than spending that time in the field growing the food and something is really out of balance with with all of that and uh, so if people could take a look you know a look at that and where your food comes from um, and uh, really think about that another thing I want to just bring up too is uh, where you buy your goods um, I was in Florida visiting my mother last winter and um, I was driving down the strip malls of empty uh, storefronts and and where were all the cars well they're all in front of Walmart and Kmart you know and um, that really was like a, a warning for us up here in this area because right now I live in Petoskey we've got a really strong downtown area um, and in Boyne City there's a strong downtown area and, and a lot of the towns up here in this area have a strong <coughs> local commerce and uh, I would say go and spend twice as much there because if you buy your hammer from Mr. Myers, um, he might end up buying something from your dad, you know. Um, it keeps the money in the, in the, in the local area. Uh, when we go to a multi-international corporation such as the Big W or the Big K, um, that money is just sucked out of the account, uh, sucked out of the community, gone forever, you know, never to come back. And they try to tell us that the wages that they give their workers is going to create some kind of economy. Well, 
I imagine after you spend eight or nine hours in one of those places, you're probably not going to want to go to another place to buy your food, shoes, records, all that stuff. So you just send your wage back into the system too. And so I, I don't see those things benefiting our communities, um, but they're here to stay, you know. Um, John Rowe here and many people in Petoskey fought Walmart from coming in and we tried, but boom, they, they flattened us, they're here. And now they're bulldozing out more and more space. It's like a disease, it's like cancer, because all, I've talked to people who live right across from Walmart, they're getting out of town, they're leaving, they don't want to sit there and have their view of Walmart. So they're moving out, clearing out more space for the cancer to grow. And uh, I know it's hard, it's hard to not go there. But um, I just, you know, whenever I have the chance, um, I just try to remind people that we're, we're losing our own money, we're losing our, our, our economy, just, it's this vacuum, it's just sucking it right out of the community. And, and, and if we don't wake up to that and don't really take, make a stance, our local businesses are gonna start getting boarded up and, you know, Russell Shoes is gonna be gone. And, and then when Russell Shoes goes out of business, Walmart's there to get all that stuff cheaper than Russell bought it for. And that's how they can sell it so cheap. Um, I also wanted to, one thing that Jen, Jenny's been a great influence in my life. And, uh, and one thing that she taught me too was about uh, kids, like eight years and younger. And, you know, I have, I've had nephews and nieces, and I always try to take them for walks in the woods and try to install some love of the earth. But when Jenny said, you can't tell them about the bad news, you know, you can't tell them where we're headed, you know, I mean, at least like the downward spiral. If you can talk about the, you know, the positive things that are happening, that's going to create some love for the earth. And most environmentalists have had someone in their life. I, mine was my grandpa, you know, just taking fishing. And, um, he loved being outside. I mean, early in the morning he'd be out. He wouldn't come in until night. And I just, being around him, just installed that love and it came natural. And so, um, 10 years now of being an environmentalist, being a horticulturalist, um, trying to figure out some way to be part of the solution instead of some of the problem. I wanted to also speak to the fact that all of us are that under seven, under eight year old child at times. And I get scared, you know, like, I mean, I can hear this stuff and wow, <laughs> that's really scary stuff that's happening, you know, that you know, WTO and GMO and all the other O's, o, O's out there. <laughs> and um, just wanted to uh, remind everyone, you know, to uh, take heart. Um, the universe is on our side, and remember that, you know, that uh, the earth is a lot larger than the corporations, and we'll win in the end, you know, it's just... I also, um, I brought some Aztec tobacco plants here that I would like, um, each and every one of you has a place to grow them, to please Feel free to take some. Um, if you want to donate something to the Green Party, that would be great. Thanks. This will be five minutes. I know uh, it, it, uh, we're probably getting on in the evening here. My name is John Rowe in Virginia. Thank you very much for the invitation this evening. Uh, these are some tough acts to follow. I'll tell you what, this lady right here, Joanne Beeman, that is 100% Joanne Beeman, okay? And so that is, when, I, when my phone rings at 7 in the morning, that's what I get. It's, this is quintessential Joanne Beeman. Boy, I uh, love you, Joanne. I love you. What a woman. Um, there are some very interesting um, topics that the Green Party has in its agenda here. And so many of them revolve around, well, you see the NAFTA, the GATT, WTO, sovereignty, uh, environmental issues. These issues all come around people. Joanne touched on it, that P word, the population word. Um, there are 61 nations in the world, the United States included, 
that is not filling their shoes. We are at what is called sub-replacement level fertility. That means there are less, there will be less people in the next generation than in the preceding generation. So why is it that our fragile planet Earth has a daily net gain of 230,000 people? In other words, births minus deaths on the Earth is 230,000 people per day. Got it? And yet 61 nations are not filling their shoes, like the United States, like all of Europe, like most of the Pacific Rim, Japan, um, uh, sub-replacement level fertility nations include, well, Italy, headquarters of the Roman Catholic Church, 1.2 children per woman in Italy. What's going on there? Obviously, where you have a level of uh, development and affluence and primarily female empowerment and female education, fertility rates come down. Um, so all the, all the things that Joanne's talking about, the exponential growth, that still goes, that's still going. We have a net gain of a quarter million people every day and it, and it keeps going. And, um, uh, thank you, Virginia and Jerry and Linda and all our great friends from Boyd and uh, elsewhere who are here today. Uh, you really are treating me so kind. You treat me like a VIP. I'm trying to dress like a VIP. I gotta tell you though, you're gonna catch on soon enough that I'm really quite ordinary. <laughs> uh, I'm not a public speaker. I'm learning the hard way. Getting a lot of practice these days. I figure another 20 years I'm gonna be really good at this. Uh, but for now I hope you, that you'll uh, bear with me. Um, one of the things I've been talking about on the campaign trail, my wife and I are starting a two-week tour of the state. We're going to pretty much every major population center in Michigan. And one of the things I've talked about is that uh, this is the year that we can really change things in this country. And I also think that this is the year that we better change things. Um, one of the things that I'd really like to change, maybe more than anything else, is the two-party system, or the one-party duopoly. parties do they have in a dictatorship? <laughs> <laughs> we, we've got one more. <laughs> okay, you know, uh, the two-party system is grossly inadequate at representing the character of our nation. Yeah. Measuring the character of our nation. It's like having a yardstick with two lines on it. You know, it, the two-party system is a parody of democracy. It's a perversion of democracy. And I have a lot of Republican friends, I have a lot of Democratic friends. I'm not ready to join either of those parties, but I think, you know, in some they've done some very good things for this country. But ultimately, if we believe in democracy, we have to break this up so that people can vote for who they really believe in and what they really believe in. So. And, uh, you know, <laughs> Uh, the two-party system looks like it's going to be with us forever, but nothing lasts forever. Uh, the sun will set on the two-party system, and it's a question of whether it's going to be a thousand years from today or whether it will be today. And it's not a reason to believe that it will be right in our lifetime that the two-party system will end. And I got nothing wrong with the idea of getting to hand, giving a little bit of a push to move history along and, and make that change in our, in our lifetimes. But uh, very interesting statistics these days. One of the most in interesting ones I saw just across my desk is the third presidential election in a row where third party candidates are expected to get 10% of the presidential vote. Yeah. Now that's never ever happened before in the history of this country. That's, it's unprecedented. And there's plenty of other statistics I could quote that would suggest that perhaps the end of the two party system will happen in our lifetime. Uh, so that gives me great hope. Uh, Natural Law Party, Reform Party. I, I should mention, by the way, the uh, music magazine that my wife and I publish, we have columns from the Green Party, but we also have a Libertarian column. We have a Natural Law column, a Reform Party column, and a Labor Party column. We have five third party columns in our paper. And the reason I do that uh, is because, you know, I mean, I, I believe in the Green Party. It's a, uh, a party for me. But I don't think that any party has a monopoly on the truth. I think the Green Party has the best ideas most of the time. We don't have all the good ideas. And I don't think anyone's wrong, or very few people are wrong all the time as well. And I think that 
each party brings a unique piece to the puzzle. And I mean, that's the beauty of democracy. So, uh, and we're seeing some great strides from all these parties. Uh, another reason to believe that uh, things, this is the year that things can really change in this country. Uh, Ralph Nader ran four years ago. That first got me interested in the Green Party. I participated for a number of months and then I got involved with the community radio struggle. But then in November of last year, when Ralph Nader talked about making a serious bid for the presidency, I, did, I um, committed myself in November that I was going to devote the year 2000 to the Green Party. And uh, I'm really glad I did that after we saw what happened with our radio issue. Uh, uh, but Ralph Nader is a man that, for whom I have almost total respect. I mean, he's really earned my respect. I, does everyone here know who Ralph Nader is? Does anyone not know who Ralph Nader is? When I go to vote for someone, I look for four things. I look for intellect, I look for industry, and how hard they're going to work for me, and uh, I look for compassion, what was the fourth thing? I can't remember. Uh, pardon me? Honesty. Honesty. Yes, thank you. Uh, is there anyone of the candidates who are running, George Bush and Al Gore, uh, you know, they're very right men, but who has uh, consistently provided that incisive analysis of the most esoteric economic issues? I mean, has it been Al Gore? Has it been George Bush? Or has it not been Ralph Nader? who has demonstrated the superior intellect of the candidates in this race. I think it's Ralph Nader. Intellect. Industry. Who spends their time on the golf courses and who has spent his lifetime working tirelessly for the public interest? And it's Ralph Nader, isn't it? Is there anybody who would dispute that? Courage. That was the other one I was looking for. I'm sorry. It's been a while since I gave the Ralph Nader pitch. Uh, <laughs> I told you I'm not a public speaker. <laughs> courage. Who had the courage as a young lawyer fresh out of law school to take on the most powerful corporation on the planet and give General Motors a big kick in the pants? Was it not Ralph Nader? Who had the courage? And compassion. Uh, <laughs> and back to courage for one second. You know, I think... Uh, Buchanan, Mr. Buchanan has something that approaches courage, but I would think more it's like boldness or arrogance. Uh, but about compassion, who has devoted himself tirelessly for four decades in fighting for the little guy, in fighting for social justice? Has it not been Ralph Nader? For, so in terms of intellect and industry and courage and compassion, is there really anyone else in this country who deserves to be our president other than Ralph Nader? Okay. So, thank you. I think Ralph Nader deserves some applause. Come on. It's the, Ralph Nader is the father of consumer activism. I hope he gets an applause out of it anyway. Uh, so anyway, uh, unfortunately, with our current political system, it takes more than courage and compassion and intellect and industry to get elected. You also have to have notoriety. You have to have uh, a network and you have to have prestige and name recognition. And Ralph Nader has those things. Certainly there's many activists in this country who equal Ralph on courage and compassion and the rest. But Ralph has the name. And unfortunately, we need to have that name. <laughs> we do. It's a reality. I mean, why do we see so many movie stars running for, for office? Because that's what it takes to get elected in this country. You have to have a name that people recognize. Greens don't have the money to go out and create name recognition for our candidates. So. When Nader talked about making a serious campaign, and he wasn't talking about winning the White House, he was talking about mounting a serious challenge to the status quo. And when Ralph talked about that, I realized what he was saying was that he was offering himself as a stepping stone to the Green Party. He was offering himself to be used by the Green Party, to build our party use his network and notoriety to build our party to a legitimate major party. And I thought if Ralph was going to do that, then I wanted to get behind him. You know, I thought that, yeah, this is the year we could really change things in this country. Yeah. And I also think, and I won't go into details, because 
I think we've got a hurricane coming in, but I really do think that this is the year we better change things. And there's a whole host of reasons to suggest why this is the year we better change things. Uh, but one of the reasons, I would say, is that uh, it may be a damn long time before such a good opportunity comes before us. So let's not wait another four years or 12 years or 200 years. Let's do it this year. And I would also mention, uh, in terms of this being the year we better change things, Ronnie Duggar, does anyone here know who Ronnie Duggar is? Ronnie Duggar is the founder of the Alliance for Democracy. Wonderful man. Wonderful man. Ronnie Duggar says, we have about 10 years left before the corporations totally consolidate their control. So that's another reason why this is the year that maybe we really better, better do it. And these next, what do we have, 39 days left, 41 days left on the petition drive, each day is precious. And we cannot afford to waste a second. Uh, it's not just our lives, but it's our children's lives. It's the future of this country. So that's one of the things that I've been talking about. Other thing that I would really like to talk about that I haven't yet so far is the campaign slogan I chose, which is the uh, name of a song by a local Michigan band, uh, Don't Let Your Dreams Get Dusty. Don't let your dreams get dusty. I just think that's a beautiful thought, isn't it? And uh, getting ready for this tour, I, I thought that, you know, I wanted to start talking about why I chose that as the theme for my campaign. Uh, because I really think that the American dream has gotten dusty. And I think there's a strong argument to be made that the American dream is dustier today than it's ever been in the history of this country. <laughs> so it's Thursday, we're packing for the trip, and I think, well, if I'm going to talk about this, well, you know, what is the American dream? And I sat down, I thought of four things that I thought typified the American dream for myself anyway. I'm sure there's many more, but let me tell you what I came up with. Uh, I thought financial security. Financial security and knowing that we're going to have enough food to feed our children. That's certainly part of the American dream. Uh, I think part of the American dream is, has something to do with independence. And this idea that, you know, as long as you don't bug the guy next to you, you pretty much should be free to dress and think and act in any way that you like, as long as you aren't bothering your neighbors, right? Isn't that part of the American dream? The sense of independence and freedom, sovereignty, individual sovereignty, cultural sovereignty. Uh, I would also say, I think that part of the American dream, kind of related to that last one, is self-sufficiency. And this idea of being able to chart your own destiny. And boy, when Rick got up and talked about the, uh, the uh, family farmer, boy, could I really relate to that, because what he typifies is exactly what I'm talking about. I mean, if you want to work for a corporation, wonderful, go for it. But I think in America, part of the American dream is that if you don't want to work for somebody else, but you want to follow your own dream, you know, you ought to have the, it ought to be viable, participating in the creation of the rules that we all have to live by. And of course, we don't participate in those at all, do we? And that one's really particularly sensitive for myself, because I spent four years on this, this national movement to uh, legalize community radio. And I really learned, personally, the hard way, how little role you and I have in shaping the rules that we all have to live by. <laughs> and I, I'd like to tell you a little bit about my story. Uh, like I said, I am a very ordinary person with not a great deal of experience in political matters. Um, but I do have one story to tell, uh, a first-hand experience to learn how corporations have really got our elected officials by the throat. Um, years ago, four years ago, my wife and I called a series of meetings in Detroit uh, uh, for members of the local music economy, local music community, club owners and record store owners and, you know, music retailers and bands and booking agents because the music economy was drying up. You know, nobody could afford to, uh, to be a musician anymore. They were all doing day jobs or, you know, they were getting the major label contract if they were lucky enough, but they couldn't do it independently. You know, that part of the American dream that you don't have to be...